Swarmageddon is the name that's been given to a plague of cicadas emerging from underground on the east coast of the US in biblical proportions, and it's happening right now. Estimates put the number at anywhere between 30 billion right up to 1 trillion or 1,000 billion. That's a heck of a lot of cicadas, and they've spent the last 17 years underground. Here in New Zealand, we have over 40 species of cicada, and summer just isn't summer without this sound. Professor Mike Raup is an entomologist from the University of Maryland who loves cicadas. He loves them so much that he eats them. More on this in just a moment. Well, Simon, this is pretty spectacular. This is uh, the season of blockbusters. We've had Iron Man 3. We've had the new Star Trek movie. But guess what? This is Mother Nature's blockbuster, and this is the best one on the planet right now. Everywhere from northern North Carolina to the Hudson Valley in New York, the span of several hundred miles, there are literally thousands and tens of thousands of cicadas emerging right now. Nobody really knows how many there will be. I've seen estimates um, ranging anywhere from about uh, 30 billion to perhaps a trillion. Uh, I was at a, um, a site in North Carolina last week where there were roughly about 40 cicada emergence holes per square foot of soil. And if you run the math on that one, that's going to translate into roughly a billion cicadas per square mile. So there are a lot of cicadas out there just now. Now, this has been called Swarmageddon. And what has actually happened here? Because my understanding of a cicada or a cicada, as I tend to call them, they, you know, they, they have a couple of different life forms. And one of those is underground, where they tend to spend a hell of a long time. And then they do this emerging thing where they come out. What's happening to make this such a massive season for cicadas? Yeah, this is one of the, again, one of the most strange uh, and, and bizarre life cycles in the entire animal world. We do have cicadas worldwide, absolutely. You guys have some spectacular cicadas down there in, in Australia and New Zealand. They, they're wonderful things. They're found worldwide. But this is the only place in the world where we have what's called periodical cicadas. These cicadas emerge in what we call broods, and a brood is a simultaneous massive emergence of three species of 17-year cicadas. For the 13-year cicada, there are actually four species that emerge simultaneously, and they're distributed over a very well-defined geographic region. So let's say Back in 2004, we had what we called the big brood. That's brood 10. This one emerged everywhere from the southern states to New England, west to the Mississippi River, halfway across the country almost in the United States. This year, we're being treated to what we call brood 2. This one has a smaller geographic range from North Carolina to New York State and Connecticut, and only on the eastern face of the Appalachian Mountains. But almost every year in some location, there is a brood of periodical cicadas emerging. They've spent the last 17 years facing a, a dreadful, dismal experience <laughs> underground, sucking on the roots of trees, feeding on a fluid we call xylem fluid. Yum. But in this last year, yeah, yeah yum, it's, it's very low in nutrients, and that may be part of the mystery, Simon, is that, that the tissue they feed on is so nutrient poor, it, it tends to extend their life cycle, we think. This is one of the hypotheses. But in the 17th year, they are up and out of the ground. The cases uh, are left on the uh, tree trunk, so at nighttime at dusk, they'll emerge from the earth from their subterranean crypts, they dash to vertical structures like tree trunks, buildings, or slow-moving people. They'll attach, their skin will split, and from the skin uh, emerges the beautiful adult cicada. After its wings harden and its body hardens, it will climb or scramble to the top of the tree. And then in a period of a, of a few days or weeks, perhaps, after the exoskeleton hardens, it becomes a big boy band in the treetops. It's only the male cicada that sings. He has an organ on his side. It's called a timbal organ, which he can vibrate and produce a noise that is roughly 90 decibels, wow. the sound of a jet airplane overhead, a lawnmower. Hey, these are teenage cicadas. It's like a rock concert up there. 
Yeah. He'll use his he'll use his calls and he has three very distinctive calls that he uses to woo his mate. The first might be a, something like, "Oh, do you come here often?" The second might be something like, oh, those are beautiful red eyes." And the third might be something, "Well, let's get out of here and go back to my place and and look at my etchings." But if she likes his performance, she'll signify her acceptance with a little flick of her wings and a click. They'll hook up and after they mate, she will move out to the tips of branches where she deposits eggs in what we call little egg nests. Those egg nests will hatch in about a month, and the tiny cicadas will rain down from as high as 80 feet in the tops of trees, 30 meters or so, hit the ground, burrow into the earth uh, another 60 cent, uh, 60, yeah, 60 centimeters. I'm trying to do the conversion. Yeah, half here. a meter. Wow. And, and attached to the roots of the trees for another 17 years. It's, it's a very strange, uh, somewhat romantic, some, somewhat silly life cycle, but, but spectacular nonetheless. Yes, yeah, 17 years subterranean sucking on sap that probably doesn't taste that great. You pop out, you do your metamorphosis thing, you get your wings, you do a bit of a sing-song, you have a, 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 a date, and then basically you die. I mean, how long do these guys, these, these adult cicadas last for? Well, a lot of them don't get through the first day. I mean, the predation on these things is enormous, Simon. But for those that are successful, they will probably last. We'll have adults up and out of the ground for perhaps about a month. So this uh, this visit by the adult cicada is rather short-lived. It'll all be over fundamentally in about a month. Yeah. So 17 years. I, I'm, I'm struggling here with this idea of a periodic hatch that's happening. You've got three species that are on the 17-year cycle You've got four species on a 13-year cycle. How the hell do they coordinate? I mean, how? Well, I've heard of a circadian clock, but not this idea of a circadian clock. I mean, how the hell do they do they tell the time and know when to come out? What's going on? What are the cues? Has anyone worked out what's going on? Well, what we think, because they're underground and it's really devoid of the typical cues, the usual zeitgebers for, for most life on the planet, the timekeepers are things like day length, photo period, and temperature. But because they're um, stripped of the ability, they, have no, they can't see the daylight, they're underground, and they're probably too deep to sense much temperature change. This is the fascinating part. What it appears they do is actually count the annual fluxes in the nutrients and perhaps the hormones in the roots of those trees. So for 17 years, they're simply counting off the annual rise and fall of nutrients and plant hormones. But in the 17th year, they listen to another timekeeper, and that's temperature. So in this last year, um, since uh, February and March, they basically, they basically have been simply waiting for the soil temperature to hit about 64 degrees Fahrenheit, or I believe that's about 18 degrees Celsius, because this is the signal, this is approximate cue, that the Earth is now warm enough for them to get up, be mobile enough and active enough so the predators can't eat them into oblivion to, to escape the predators, but also to be able to move up into the treetops, sing, mate, romance, and then lay eggs in the tender shoots. So during this last year, it really is about temperature. The previous years, the synchrony, we believe, is being gauged by the, these annual changes in nutrients in the roots of the trees. And what a clever way to, I guess, make sure that your population is going, your species is going to survive, you know, having this 17-year cycle. I mean, there aren't many predators that are going to sit around for 17 years after the first session and go, hey, let's wait for another 17 years. We'll have another big feed in this area. I mean, you're going to sort of outsmart most of the clever birds and other predators, aren't you? Yeah, who's got time for that? Nobody can wait 17 years. And, and this strategy, it's, it's just brilliant on the part of these cicadas. Basically, it's, it's unheard of pretty much, I think, in, in all of the animal world, a strategy 
by which you simply emerge in such massive numbers simultaneously that no predator, no single predator, no collective group of predators, and everything will want to eat a cicada. All these predators will simply eat their fill, and there will still be enough cicadas to perpetuate the species. It's called predator satiation. It's a safety in numbers game, one of the most bizarre of all evolutionary strategies in the entire natural world. But hey, <laughs> these guys have been around for for hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years, and it's working for them. How clever. It is clever. Are there any serious threats, though, to this volume of insects emerging from the ground? Are they a hazard? Are they a pest? Are there concerns at the moment? Well, some people fear the cicada. Some people love the cicada. I happen to be in that latter group. Some people eat the cicada, and I've done that as well. But uh, back to your point, uh, I think for, for people that fear insects, this can be a rather disturbing time. And, and my advice to them is if they need to simply find a place, go take a little holiday perhaps somewhere uh, where they're not going to encounter cicadas because in places where the cicadas exist, there will literally be tens of thousands of these things in your backyard, in your neighborhood. So for those folks, uh, it's problematic. But for the rest of us, it is just one spectacular opportunity to see the whole circle of life. It's got birth. It's got death. It has romance. It's got sex. It's got everything in it. So it's it's like watching a, a fantastic um, documentary in your own backyard. The only real harm here, I think, is is the young um, the young trees are the perfect place for cicadas to lay their eggs. I mentioned that the females will deposit those eggs in the tips of branches. So if you have recently planted, let's say, young fruit trees, things like apples or peaches or pears or even other hardwood trees like oak trees or sweet gums. Um, they will use more than 200 different species of woody plants to lay these eggs because these young trees have so many tender young branches. They can get pretty hammered by those female cicadas laying eggs. The mature trees, this is not going to be a problem, but for young trees, uh, they can be damaged, and we recommend that people put netting over those trees at this point in time to prevent the females from laying their eggs. We we want people to put nets over these trees rather than to go out with pesticides and spray these things. That that makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, Mike, earlier you said you'd eaten cicadas. How'd you cook them? Well, sometimes I eat them raw. Uh, this weekend in North Carolina, I was treated to... Uh, a cicada barbecue. I've had them stir fried. I've had them lightly breaded uh, and uh, deep fried. Uh, if you take cicadas and and toss them in with a little bit of garlic and oil and maybe some greens uh, in a stir fry, they're pretty delicious. But they're they're fine just right out of the right out of the shell. I call them soft shell cicadas. The the tender young stage of the adult insect. We call it the tenoral when it just uh, splits uh, the skin of its, uh, of its nymphal stage and climbs out. There are no hard parts. It's very easy to uh, pick these off and eat them. Uh, they've got a delicate, nutty flavor, uh, a kind of a buttery texture with just hints, just traces of the tannins from the plant roots that they've sucked on for 17 years. I think they'd be delicious in the afternoon, perhaps, with a nice uh, New Zealand Chardonnay. <laughs> Entomologist Professor Mike Rout from the University of Maryland. And that ends our look at Swarmageddon. And that ends our look at Swarmageddon. And that ends...